holding my chest. My legs and hands. Silence. Feeling the pressure. What? She was a fraud. It's a million bloody degrees out there. Oh, wind. I'm sorry if I said anything awful. Blessed lambs of God. Why hadn't he got up to chop the capsicums? I was never a good reader. Ah, but immaculately bland. Anyway, it looks like... What do we do with this now? We're not even supposed to use the word fat. Boys like girls. When we were very young... I was back home in Norwich. Square Sound. You're listening to the audiobook podcast for the makers and listeners of audiobooks. Here we are again, Abby. Here we are again. Yes, lovely to see you. Lovely to see you too. Thank you. And today we're talking about what happens when you actually get the golden grail, you get offered a book and you say, yes, I want to read that book. What do you do next? What do you do next? Okay. And hey, Ab, can I point out something that in a way it's bleedingly obvious, but Mm. when I point this out to my students, it's like a light globe moment. With voice work, Unique amongst all other forms of acting. You don't need to learn your lines. Absolutely. That is one of the joys of voiceover work. It's completely spontaneous. You don't usually get the script until you get to the studio, unless it's something for the biology department of Melbourne Uni and you need to work out a whole lot of words. You don't get it. So you go into the studio and you are reading in a tiny box world, very short form language that's all been shrunk beautifully by somebody in advertising, usually. If you're performing on stage, if you're doing Hamlet, you've got to learn, That's I think that's the longest Shakespeare, you've got to learn all those lines, all those wherefore arts and dosest thou. If you're doing an audiobook, you don't need to have learnt your lines, but it would be a very naive or a very arrogant person who came in to do an audiobook without having actually read, read the book. The book. <gasps> Kel horror. Well, that would just fill me with terror, really, because prepping the book, the work that you do before you get into the studio is really the most important work that you do. Understanding, well, first of all, I would say you read the book, as many people would agree. Just as a person, as a, as a, person, a reader. As a reader. You've, yep. you've got this book, you've decided to buy it, and you're going to read it. That will give you lots of insights into the audience of the book, you know, who the book is for, yeah. before you actually then dive into who the character is. If you're doing a first-person narration, of course, it is about what is the author's intention and how, how do you feel about this book and who is that character. And so you have to jump into a character's state completely psychologically, and the character's story, history. It is just quite a complex and deep immersion into a book. It's not ever going to be about just reading the words in a nice way. It is totally about telling the story. I think that one of the most important things you can do in prep, when, once you've read that book and you start to prepare it from your perspective as a voiceover narrator, is to understand that sentence structure and language that is written down... On the page. On the page. Mm-hmm is never going to guide you as an audiobook narrator. Absolutely. You can't follow correct sentence structure as in there's a sentence with a full stop so I'll get all the way through that to the end and stop. That's not the way it works in spoken word. I always say to people that the punctuation is there for the eye, for the reader on the page, Mm. and that for the reader reading out aloud, it's often going to be not as it appears on the page. Absolutely. And you need to parse the sentence and make sense of it Mm. to know where you need to put the beats and the emphasis. Yeah. So when you see a comma in a sentence that makes sense in a a grammatical way or a sentence structure way, it's not always where you put the pause as in spoken word. Mm. I mean, I, I break it down to different thoughts and ideas or moments because what you're trying to do is take the listener on a journey with you. So it has to sound like everything you're talking about, you've just had that in the moment, and you're just going to deliver it. Yes. So it does always feel like it's in the moment. It's never read. One suggestion we often give to people, particularly first-time narrators, is to read aloud before they come into the studio. And you mentioned prep time earlier, how valuable that is. And I can tell you that the amount of time you spend in preparation will almost always mean you spend less time in the studio. Absolutely. Because you've worked it all out. So instead of having to find your feet in the studio and, you know, making the mistakes in the studio, you've already sussed it. Already sussed it. And so, you know, you might think, oh, this seems like a lot of time to prepare, but you'll be in and out of the studio much quicker. Yeah. Guarantee it. I agree. You know, when when I had my first big book, I started by reading it, not just, you know, as we were talking before, just like a reader, but as the performer. I was so excited about the fact I had this big book and it was a big, thick book and it had lots of characters in it and lots of different voices. And so I started to read it 
allowed from the first. And all of a sudden I thought, oh my God, this is taking me hours to get through this book because it will. As I was reading it, I was going back over things and working out how I was going to perform it. So what I did, I reached a certain point and I thought, well, I know those characters yes. now. They're all quite familiar. Now I'm going to read it just reading it. Yes, And yes. so that shrunk the time. But, of course, by the time I got to the end, well, then when I was reading it just as a reader, I already had those voices of the characters in my head. Ah, oh, I see. And knew what they were doing yep. and knew how, the rhythms. So I was playing the, the voice of myself reading in my head as I was kind of speed reading it. It is really speed reading it when you do it in your head. Yeah, that's true. It takes a lot longer to read it out loud. One of the reasons we suggest, particularly first-time narrators, read some of the book aloud, probably not the whole book, as you say, mm, because that mm. could take a long time, but just get them to record it. Yeah, every smartphone's got a record voice record app mm. and listen back. Yeah. And critique themselves. Yeah their performance and just think about what may be working, what mightn't be working, what needs to shift. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a really valuable tool for people to use. Yeah, it's really key. I was also thinking because I've recently had to read a book that had, it was a memoir, and it had a lot of Czech, Polish, German words in it and pronunciations, and a lot of words that I didn't understand and a lot of names I didn't understand, names of places, names of people. So I was really fortunate that I could make a list of these and as I did in an analogue way, in a, in a notebook, and then contacted the author and we did it direct over the phone. Mm. There were a lot of things that she knew that was the way it was written, didn't know how, how it was pronounced. pronounced. Yep. Did mm. the, the Google searches, I did some myself. She did some. I spoke to a Czech neighbour of hers, actually sent some recordings. She spoke to the Czech neighbour, not me. And then we used those tools that they have, how just say, it's how H-O-W-J-S-A-Y, how just say. It's the best. It's the it's best. It's the most authoritative. It's fantastic, yeah. isn't it? And then the other one is um, 4VO, F-O-R-V-O. They can be very useful. So it is crucial you get those things right mm. because what you don't want is to get into the studio, stumble over something or be unsure and say, how do we pronounce this? That's something else that takes a long time. And also, if you do make mistakes, you're back in the studio. For pickups. After, for pickups. Yep. And, you know, what you're trying to do is build a relationship with the studio, with the producers, with the publisher. If you want to do this and you want to go on and on and on, it's about how do you perform? How do you perform in the studio? What's your prep like? Everyone can tell if you haven't prepped a book, you know. <laughs> and then how do you get through those trickier things? Mm. And we should, at this point, make it clear we have fiction and non-fiction and you have to approach them quite differently. With fiction, often there's a lot more leeway. Sometimes the author will have clear and strong ideas and they all communicate that to us. We do try to keep a channel of communication with the publisher and the author. So I recently did a young adult sort of dystopian fantasy mm. and there were words that she had made up for, for in this right. dystopian world. Yep. So I checked with her how she heard them in her head mm. because just wanted them to be right. Fantasy is a, a big one, particularly some with made-up languages and stuff yeah, like that. Sure. Yeah. And sometimes authors have a strong idea of characters. Sometimes we'll have a character development session with the author and the actor, just having a conversation and the producer mm. about how the author perceives certain voices. If that doesn't happen, if the author doesn't have strong ideas, that gives you more leeway to develop those how you want. Mm. But non-fiction is a very different matter because non-fiction you have to get things right. Absolutely. And you have to allow the time for research. We've recorded some really sort of heavy-duty non-fiction stuff on really broad range of topics. And again, if you've got the channel of communication with the publisher and the author, as you did with your recent memoir, yeah. and you can follow up stuff with them, that's great. But sometimes they don't know, as you found. So then we have to think about the resource tools for finding that information, those pronunciations, that information that you need. Yeah. I mean, YouTube, how did we exist without so the internet? How did we survive? How did we survive? I mean, YouTube can be really valuable, but you have to know that the source you're checking is authoritative. So if it's the pronunciation of someone's name, if you can find a TEDx talk where they say, hello, I am Justine Sloan yeah. Lees, welcome to my TEDx talk, yeah. saying their own name is yeah. always preferable. Sure. If it's someone introducing them, you can't be sure that they're saying it right, you'd like to think they are, but mm. they may not be. And in that case, I'd look at several different YouTube clips and find a consensus. Yeah. 
go with that. The most often said that can be really handy. Place names are really tricky. People are really particular about place names. And if Mm. you say the place name of where someone lives incorrectly, it really stands out. I did a book recently set in WA. Now, people from Fremantle get very funny if you say Fremantle. They do. You would know because you're from WA. They're from Albany and they say Albany. It's like Albany. (laughs) So, yes, that's true. So there's all kinds of ways of researching those. I'm a big fan of YouTube clips of real estate agents. Yes, yep. spruiking oh, properties. Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, sort of expensive properties. They'll yeah. have YouTube clips of the agent saying, Welcome to this prestige apartment right on the foreshore at Fremantle. Yeah, that's right. And you go, <laughs> That's how you say it. That's how you say it. Yeah, absolutely. But you can do things like ring the post office or ring the Shire office or that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. It doesn't take long and it's worth doing. Because you get it right. Yeah. And then I guess the question about it is how do we actually look at a word that says C Z K S with no, no, you know, no, no vowel? <laughs> how do we actually work out how to make that word work for us? Particularly if you don't know the IPA. If you don't know it. Yeah. Exactly. I work a lot with phonetics anyway, and I just write it in my little notebook what it is. And when we get to that passage in the studio, I say, hang on a minute, there's a doozy coming up. I just want to familiarise myself with the sound phonetically, and then hopefully we can do it. Sometimes it's like, get me as close to it as you can. We'll drop in after this sentence, and then I'm just going to fly it. How was that? I'll say, did it work? (laughs) But I know there are other ways. You know, I mean, I've never used notation tools. This is another thing that's worth talking about in this conversation. Do you read off paper or do you read off a screen? Mm, mm. We don't have a preference of ourselves. We want what's best for you. But Mm. obviously, the less trees cut down, the better. So we have an iPad and... We give that to people to use for their reading. Or if people still are analogue and prefer paper, that's absolutely no problem. We can do paper and then people can mark up to their heart's content on yeah. paper. The paper has its problem because of the, the noise the, whole, the noise of paper. Yeah. And I love using the, the iPad now. Fantastic. You're a convert. So fabulous. <laughs> well, the look, there's way. ways of managing paper, which the most important of which is don't attempt to move paper while you're reading. Sure. When we get to the end of a page, we stop. Normally, people can have two pages up side by side. That's Mm -hmm, fine. mm -hmm. So it's about maybe four to five minutes of audio. Mm -hmm. And then when we get to the bottom of the second page, we just have a beat. I stop the recording. We turn the pages over. And then we just get the next two up Mm -hmm. and we just pick up. It's not a problem. If people prefer that, really, that's fine. And some people don't like reading off screens. It's fine. Mm -hmm. But, yep. The iPads are great, and with the iPad, we'll get sent um, a PDF of the script. So there's a number of annotation tools you can use. The one we use here is iAnnotate, yeah. which is available for about 15 bucks. Not right. expensive, so it's okay. And you can do all kinds of annotations on that. You highlight your dialogue, which is a common thing that people do, highlight the dialogue in right. different colours for different characters. Yeah. You can write notes. There's a little typewriter thing. You can navigate back and forth. You can search for a word. But one of the really nifty things it's got is a little record function. So if you come to that terrifying check word without any vowels Mm -hmm. and you've checked a pronunciation with someone who can give it to you and you've written it down in your little phonetic way, Mm -hmm. what you can do is use this little record function to record a little voice memo of you saying the word. And then every time you get to that word again, you just press it again and it'll play it back to you. Well, that's clever, isn't that's it? That's clever. <laughs> yeah, pretty nifty. <laughs> so there are other tools that are like that, and I suppose there will be others in the future because it's more of a thing now, but I guess that's a really important thing to consider. So if you've got a book, the book gets sent to you in a PDF, and then yep. if you have an iPad, then you put it onto your iPad and then you do the work before you get to the studio. But then do you send it to the studio so they can put it on their iPad for you or do you bring your own iPad in? Either or. Okay. So, But we do have an iPad available for narrators here, so mm. it's not a problem. Mm. Fantastic. People vary in how much they mark up scripts. Some people, their f- script is festooned with colours and notes and yeah, stuff, and some yeah. people just, like the wonderful Paul English, who's been doing audiobooks forever, he just uses the tiniest little pencil markings that make sense to him. Mm, sure. You know, sure. Em- emphasise, you know, underlines the word he's going to emphasise in a sentence. Yeah. He marks out the beats and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Everyone's different. But it all goes back to preparation, what you need to do to prepare. Yeah. See, that for me is all completely mental. So I don't mark the script at all. I just want to answer the questions about what does this mean or or spot the typos. 
Typos do happen. That's they a good do point. Happen. They do happen. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really worth talking about because mm. it's rare to have a manuscript that actually has no, no typos. typos. Yep. And the typos can be minor. You know, it's is instead of it, and you your sure. eye just doesn't even Our clock instead it. Instead of out. I mean, just the little things like that. Yeah. But sometimes it can be really fundamental, and you can be going, "Holy moly, what's going on here?" Mm-hmm. So if something like that happens when you're prepping. Don't think, um, my bad, I just don't understand. Ask. Ask. You have to, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've found just words missing, just linking words missing mm. and little things like letter typos. That They're small, but they are always got to ask them, even though it might feel silly. It's like it's obvious that it's an hour, not an out. Might not be. And that's also an indication of the level at which you are reading it deeply. It's not just about, oh, yeah, I kind of get what this story's about now, going on and on and on. You absolutely have to look at everything properly, deeply. And I also think it's worth talking about the fact that we have to be accurate to the text. Yeah. And that's a fundamental part of audiobook production. People using contractions, for example, people saying it's instead of it, it is. is. Generally speaking, that's okay because that's more how we would speak rather than how we would write. So little things like that, he'd instead of he would fine, I'm not going to pick you up on that, unless it's something very precise. And I used to record poetry in my previous life, and that is something that would matter in that context. But in a novel, it's probably going to help lift it off the page and make it more immediate and more to life. But other things, you know, sometimes people rewrite things in their head and say what they think it should say instead of what it actually (laughs) says. It's a bit naughty. (laughs) But it does happen. Yeah, we have to go back and redo that so it's as per the text. As per the text. Well, one thing I noticed and discussed with the author was that sometimes we would come to a, a bit in this memoir where she would have quoted somebody and what happens is you see the quote marks, mm-hmm. you start reading it and then halfway through it she says, says Richard yes. and then go on for more. Mm. So I asked if I could introduce that Richard said something before the quote. Quotes can be hard to separate out from the text Mm. and I agree totally when you're in the quote and then you drop out to according to Richard Mm. or whatever. It can be a bit dissonant and I did something recently where I said, look, I think we should have this attribution of the quote at the beginning and at the end it's obvious where it ends. And, and we just go back the into the narrative yeah. and they said, yeah, okay, that's fine, that yeah, makes sense. Yeah. But we do have to put that stuff to the publisher right, and okay. the author, generally speaking. But if it makes it easier for the ears and more clear to the audience, there's not normally too much argument. No, I wouldn't think so. Yeah. Footnotes are something that we have to deal with in nonfiction. I did a book a few years ago that just had footnotes on every single page. And, and you did the footnote. Oh, how did you do the footnotes? Well, in a way, it became a juggling exercise. Footnotes sort of by definition are an extension to an idea but not part of the core narrative. And in this instance, they're often quite humorous. He was making a little, having a little pun here or a little joke there. So if we could elide them into the text in a way that made it sound like a funny aside, Mm. you know, me telling you a funny little bit on the side, we did it, but others just didn't work. And particularly if they look things like facts and figures and statistics, that can get boring. So in the book, you see that there is a the mark saying that there's an annotation, mm. there's a number. So do you do it at the Not moment? Not necessarily at that point, yeah. So it's it's got a number one for mm. footnote number mm-hmm. one. That might not be the best place to put it. So Ooh, could get really... Yeah. Quite complicated. It, it, well, in this particular instance it did, but that was an exception. There were an extremely large number of them. But mm. if you have a book of nonfiction and it does have footnotes, then perhaps it's worth having that conversation during your prep period with your mm. producer mm. or the head of production about how it's going to be tackled in this instance. Yeah, sure. One time when it is okay to change the text is if you have a book that, for instance, says, when you read the below, consider this. Mm-hmm. And no one who's listening to the audiobook is actually reading it. So then it's quite okay for us to go, as you listen to what's to follow, consider this. Right, yeah, sure. And that's fine. And that's okay just to change it on the fly. Yeah. There's another thing I wanted to talk about, which is how do you handle things like when you you get to the book and you have a a forward, so somebody's done a forward for you. Mm -hmm. Say this is a first-person narrator with a character voice, okay? So you've got a forward. Then you have chapter headings or you have a a little saying at the beginning. You have a dedication or those kind of things. Most books do. Yeah, most books do. Yeah. So whose voice do you do it in? Do you do it as you? A bit more neutral, I think. I personally would prefer not to have people have to go chapter one, chapter two, 
chapter three, because for me, as a listener, it kind of lifts me out, but it is a convention that we have to observe. Mm, so, mm. you know, so probably in the same way you'd say those things or this is the end of CD2. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> That's funny because, of course, some audiobooks are still recorded for the CD. CDs. Yeah, we, and so we have to do that. So at the end yep. of the session we have to have someone read, this ends CD2, CD3, this ends CD3, and CD on and four. on. Hey, mm. can I tell you, do you know the word that people stumble over the most? What? That. Oh, that. <laughs> because the problem is that people say that. Like it's a that word with an A? No, it's not, no, it's, it's not about pronunciation. It's about the way we speak and written English. So it's very common in written English to have, I heard that that had happened. There's oh, two that's that, together. That, yeah, I heard that that had happened. And that makes sense. Both different. But sometimes when people are speaking, they don't say it like that. They say, I heard that had happened. That had happened. Mm. Yeah. And I find that when there's two that's, people only want to say one. And when there's one that, people want to say two. <laughs> but I don't get hung up. I let them well, I let them get away with that. That's one instance where I think, look, it's it's more about the um, translating the written word into the spoken word. Well, it's interesting because if you put two that's together, they mean something slightly differently. They so do. I, I always think that actually looking at them as being a different word, even though they're spelt the same way, is, is important. So I would say I heard that it would be a, a, a short look, vowel. Yeah, yeah. That that had happened. I heard that okay. that had happened. Oh, that's interesting. So it's it's like the first that is a that. Yeah. It's not really a that. It's not a bit of a it's, a it's a lazier that. Yep. It's yep. not an at sound. Yeah. So I heard that that had happened. That sounds like they are two different words. Mm. There's a slightly different inflection on mm. the words. So that's the way I get through that that. Because had had is another that, one. That, I bought a coffee cup recently for a friend and it said, all the coffee she had 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 no effect. <laughs> And, of course, it looks brilliant on the mug, all those hats, but it's a perfectly grammatical sentence. English is a really weird language. <laughs> Very weird. Boy, that's a that's a doozy. <laughs> I want a cup like that. That's fantastic. So what else are we going to talk about? Finding character voices. Mm. Wonderful Leith, when she was here, was talking how she finds accents and character voices. And I should emphasise again, as I think I have a few times, that normally you'll be asked to narrate in something that's pretty close to your natural voice. Sure. But when you're working with fiction and you've got lots of characters, how do you shift out those characters? Mm. How do you differentiate them to the ear? Mm. You don't always have dialogue tags, you know, he said, she said, sure. he said, That's John right. said, Jill said. So how do you separate them out? And the most immediate one is a slight pitch shift. That's the most easiest and obvious one, which is you've got your narration tone, but then you've got a female, so you just shift up slightly. Sure. And for a male tone, you just drop it slightly into your bottom end of your yeah, range. Yeah. That's the most easiest and obvious. Yeah. I always feel that working with characters, see, the thing about it is that the listener knows that there's one person reading the book. Even if you are narrating in character, yeah. it's still you narrating. Yeah. Except for children, I think, which I always find a, a much younger sound or pitch for. I try and actually attribute a character trait or a mm -hmm. position, a yep. psychological position or an attitude to the character. Yes. You know what? I've got a young actor we work with quite a bit and what he does is he reads the book first for meaning but when he does his second read for prep, mm. he notes every adjective that's used to write a character. So if you say someone's yeah. edgy and brittle, yeah. you can give them a kind of punchy sort of tight tone that will convey some of that yeah. personality attribute of that person. I think that's the most useful thing for book narrating. So you're not plagued by it. Once you set a character's mm. attitude and you find that adjective or that position for them, then you're good with that. Unless they have a kind of a, a change and they become really different. <laughs> yes, yes. And actually we had that recently with something where the author was saying, he looks like the good guy, but he turns out to be the bad guy. But at the moment you have to think he's the good guy. But then when you realise he's the bad guy, you have to think, think, oh, yeah, there were some hints that he was the bad guy when he was being the good guy. And yeah. I was like, Whoa. oh, God. <laughs> um, Head spin. Another technique people often use too that's worth mentioning is they assign that character in the book to the personality and character of either a movie. So as this character, I might do Tom Hanks in that film and then that's an instant mental reference. Mm -hmm. Or else to someone they know. Mm. Now, yeah. I complimented yeah. someone once on their wonderful school headmistress voice, and he said, well, that's my mother. Yeah. Amazing. 
Hey, something else it's worth mentioning, particularly mm. with character voices, yep. but also just with text in general, is consistency. So once you've made a choice, just go with it. You yeah. know, or once you and the director together have made the choices, just be consistent. I'm always listening to consistency of character voices yeah. and sometimes we'll go back and play an earlier clip to check. The people who do our quality control, that's one of their briefs, is to check that kind of thing. Yeah, sure. But also things, for example, like pronunciations, of course, but if you're doing non-fiction and there's a lot of dates, do you go 2018 or 2018? Exactly. Once you've made that choice, whatever it is, yep. just go with it. That's right. Don't Set the float. conventions so you don't get caught up. Yep, totally. Another question people sometimes have is about diction. Mm. Again, hopefully we've cast you well and it's in your natural range. We normally want diction to sound reasonably good, of course, but sometimes not too crisp. You know, sometimes people try to over-pronounce and over-articulate and yeah. that might be fine in other contexts, but for a whole book, if you consider the average book is, say, eight to ten hours long, that is, A, hard for you to sustain, and also it can get a bit wearing on the ear. You want it to be conversational. You want it to be like someone you'd talk to in a normal context. So I would say err on the side of kind of relaxed. Again, this might be a way of characterising out a character, someone who, the headmistress, mm -hmm. might have extremely precise crisp diction and that might be absolutely. something you can use. The bloke whose diction is absolutely appalling. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah sloppy as all bugger. Yeah, you that's know. right. <laughs> no, it's good. Well, that's recognisable, you know. I mean, that is creating characters. That's yeah. who you have to do. Yeah. And I mentioned dialogue tags. Not all books have them, but when they do have them, they're not always he said, she said, he said. It can be he murmured, she shrieked. Absolutely. And if there is a dialogue tag with a word like that, a descriptor, an adjective like that, you have to do it. You because have to do it. Mm. If you say very brightly, da 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 da, yep. he whispered. Mm. It's like, oh, instant yep. dissonance. So um, worth keeping those in mind. Absolutely. So, Ab, I think we've covered a lot of what you need to think about before you come into the booth. Exactly. So let's move on for our next podcast with what happens when you're in the booth. That's a great idea. The moment of truth. Let's do that. Okay. See you next time. Thanks. You've been listening to the audiobook podcast brought to you by Square Sound. If there's something that we haven't covered in our audiobook series that you'd like to know about, send us a message at studio.squaresound.com. .au. The audiobook podcast was produced by Marianne Plaza together with Abby Holmes and Justine Sloan Lees. With special thanks to all our guest speakers, Square Sound is an audiobook and podcast studio in Melbourne, Australia. Thanks for listening.